keto freaks, this is Carl. Do you or someone you know have trouble focusing? You know what I'm talking about. You sit down to read something, try to figure out your monthly budget, write that novel you've been putting off, or maybe you just can't seem to do one task at a time. Well, you may not know this, but I'm a musician as well as a software developer. Programming is a job that requires focus, long periods of uninterrupted work. It's hard for them and for you. I've created music to code by. This is music, yes, but it's specifically and scientifically designed to promote focus. Studies show that when math students were exposed to Baroque music between 60 and 80 beats per minute, they did better with comprehension and testing. So I created more modern music that is neither boring nor distracting, but falls within that tempo range. It's just the right mix. I also made the pieces 25 minutes long. That correlates to research that shows we all get brain fatigue after 20 or so minutes of hard focus. The result is thousands of happy customers. Now, you don't have to be a programmer to reap the benefits of music to code by. It has been known to soothe restless pets, calm fussy babies, and even help autistic kids relax and fall asleep. Listen to some free samples at musictocodeby.net. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. I'm Carl Franklin in Connecticut in the United States, and I've recently started a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. G'day, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet for two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I also have type 2 diabetes, and we're going to share the progress of my journey through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis, and hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors, and we don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. Uh, we're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail. Uh, we have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite the research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. We're also going to share some of the great food that we can eat on this diet. And every episode, we both share a recipe for an essential keto meal that we eat regularly. So, Richard, let's start podcast number eight, the Type 2 Diabetes Show. Yeah. Hey. So, Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Uh, nope. No? Wow. No, not a, single, not a single correction, nothing to apologize for. Well, maybe we'll screw something up today and somebody will point it out to us. <laughs> yeah, you never know your luck. <laughs> right. Uh, how would you do this week? Um, I've had the in-laws visiting over the Easter break, um, and my father-in-law is a chef. So we've done a bit of fine dining. Nice. Yes. On on Monday, we went out to Julie's Club. Uh, it's a national press club. Um, and uh, they they aspire to a Michelin star this year. So oh. uh, it was totally non-keto and I don't care. Yeah. I ate about 300 grams of food and put on about three kilos of weight. So, uh, But, you know, this is the thing. It's just water weight. It's, you know, you wouldn't worry if you drank three liters of water. You wouldn't worry about what your weight had done. Hmm. And I went for a bike ride afterwards and uh, uh, about 90 minutes of exercise and I had lost all that three kilos. So that was all good. It's pretty cool, isn't it? When you can do that. It's nice to know about what's happening. It, it, it's, it's frustrating if you don't know what's happening, but hmm. uh, it's nice to have an understanding of it. Uh, and on Thursday, we ate at a Korean barbecue place and that was entirely keto or barbecue meat. Awesome. So how are you going, Carl? You sound like you got a bit of a cold. I do have a bit of a cold. You noticed. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I went to a conference out in San Francisco this week. I was out there all week from Monday to Saturday, and I picked up a little friend, some sort of virus who hitched a ride on me, and no wonder because there are people there from all over the world. It was a Microsoft conference. 
Oh, right. So, it was like 10,000 people? Yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah, Build was the name of it. But anyway, uh, I stayed at a friend's house, Scott Stanfield. You probably know him. Nobody else does. That's all right. (laughs) He's uh, got this really old Victorian house in Berkeley, California. It's the second oldest house, and he's very proud of it. And, of course, he wants everybody to come over and stay. And the first night, we made carnitas. Mm, Nice. And that's going to be my recipe. Oh, awesome. Because I learned how to do it. It's basically pork cooked in lard. Mmm, yum, yum, yum. Does that sound good? <laughs> well, my recipe today is actually going to be how to uh, how to eat fast food. Uh, so, how to eat fast food and be totally keto. Very, very helpful. Well, um, just to reprise, let's talk about what the ketogenic diet is. You basically restrict your carbs to incidental carbs. In other words, no bread. No sugar, no uh, uh, grains of any kind, no rice, no potatoes, um, nope, not, not even that. not even sweet potatoes or starchy vegetables. The only uh, ve- no fruits. The only vegetables we eat are green leafy vegetables, and you know gr- anything green, pretty much celery, yeah. broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, lettuce. That kind of stuff, spinach. Any vegetable that doesn't store its energy underground, like a potato or a, you know, a vegetable like a carrot or something like that. We do have a few fruit. For example, I'll, I'll have a few blueberries, but in a meal, I might have three or four blueberries as a, like a garnish over the top of a salad. So it's not a lot. Not a lot. Yeah. So incidental carbs, and most of the calories that we get come from fat, whether they're fat that we eat or fat that is stored. That's right. And yeah. just enough protein to keep our muscles healthy. And that, as we had said before, is uh, you have to calculate that. But for a guy like me, you know, three hundred and twenty-eight pounds, something like that, uh, about a hundred grams of uh, protein but that's just an estimate and it's worked well for me all right well we got some mail we got some mail awesome we're just defining we don't need no mail 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 nice <laughs> so what do we got Carl? this is actually a comment that was left on two keto dudes.com oh, that counts yeah it's from scott fry Mm-hmm. Hi, Carl and Richard, number two. And he says that because <laughs> Carl and Richard is of course. that other podcast that I do with that other Richard. It's kind of sure. funny. Great podcast, as all the pop podcasts are. I've been listening to .NET Rocks since episode 10 or so. I am not on a keto diet yet, and I'm not diabetic and only about 15 to 20 pounds overweight. But the pounds climb every year, and I'm looking to reverse it. I have lots of points, but I'll limit this note to two that might be interesting to discuss in future episodes. Number one, what is the relationship to keto diet and the eating of low glycemic index foods? Ah, yeah. I've heard they turn into sugar in your system much slower than high glycemic foods. This also leads me to wonder which carbs you eliminate in a keto diet. Clearly potatoes, rice, and flour-based foods, but where do sweet potatoes and other root veggies like carrots come in? on the keto diet. And I think we were just talking about that, weren't we? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Pretty much any vegetable that stores its energy below ground is storing it in the form of starch. We we don't have any starches or sugars in bulk. And even though sweet potatoes are low glycemic, they still raise insulin levels, which they may do it slower. Yeah. One of the problems with uh, being a type 2 diabetic is we produce 10 times the insulin of a normal person for the same uh, the same glucose challenge. So uh, we really have a problem with uh, food that releases glucose slowly over time. Because we release a lot of insulin, uh, we end up having a lot of insulin area under the curve. So um, for us, uh, it, it doesn't matter if it's low glycemic. If it's going to slowly release carbs into our system, we're going to be producing insulin for the entire time. Right. So I hope that answers that one. And the second point, Scott says, is I do aerobics every other day and usually burn between 800 to 1,000 calories over the course of an hour. Something significant happens 20 minutes into my workout. I start breathing heavier. I start sweating heavier. I get over the sluggishness that I feel at the beginning of my workout and start feeling like I have lots of energy. I've been told this is the point that the body stops using the sugar reserve and converts to burning fat. I would love to know more about how this relates to the keto adaptation and is doing this three to four times a week, making me more keto adapted than I otherwise would be. Is this a shortcut to becoming keto adapted and related runners often report a quote unquote runner's high or being addicted to running and can't miss their regular exercise. 
Is this possibly because they are keto adapted? Richard, do you get this high from your biking and does it seem different from how you feel when you're keto adapted? Thanks to both of you for the podcast. It's got my mind working and hopefully I'll be able to try the keto diet in the near future. Sure. No, that's uh, thanks for sending that in. Uh, prior to going keto, I would never get a, a runner's high or a cyclist's high. Uh, mm. It was uh, it was always difficult to exercise. I always had to push myself to do it. Prior to keto, I was still going to the gym four days a week, and I was cycling um, uh, thirty or forty k a week, and I was hating every bit of it. But I felt mm. that I had to do it. The difference since going keto is all of a sudden. About a week or two into keto, all of a sudden I ran out the door and jumped on my bike and just went riding for the joy of it. And sometimes I'll ride up a hill to get that runner's, that, that cyclist's high or that mm. exercise high. Um, I, I get those endorphins very, very quickly. So uh, yeah. it's, it's a remarkable what a difference that made. As far as being able to get there in 20 minutes, I don't know. I mean, yeah. if you're not already adapted, um, I don't think that that would be the case. I mean, if you're a gluco burner, certainly you'd have to deplete your glycogen, which can take a day or so, can it? Yeah. If, if you're a marathon runner, towards the end of the marathon, you, you will have burned through your glycogen reserve. So you really have quite a lot of energy. You have a day's worth of energy stored there. And, and, uh, and if, you, uh, if you're working flat out, it'll take you about two hours to burn through it all. So I don't believe that what you're, you're experiencing here is switch, a switching from glucose to fat burning. I think what you're experiencing here is your body adapting to the fact that you are now exercising and becoming more efficient in that moment because it knows this is what you're doing. And it may be that your insulin is already low to begin with and that, uh, you know, just because you have weight doesn't mean that you have high insulin or hyperinsulinism or any of that. And uh, you may you may already be in a state where 20 minutes in you could start uh, you could start reaping the benefits. But but I mean, as long as you're not eating carbs, I'd, I don't know. I, we, I guess we'd have to talk a little bit more, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you, Scott. And uh, if you got any comments, you can leave them at twoketodudes.com or you can send us email, dudes at twoketodudes.com. All right, so we're going to talk about diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes today. We'll cover type 1 in detail in another show, only because this is something that we personally don't have a lot of expertise in you know, the sort of ins and outs of, di of type 1 diabetes, but we'll find people that do. We, we love to be challenged. We've both researched what affects us. So that's what we've got the most, uh, uh, the most experience in and the most, uh, uh, most interest in. Um, but I'm very interested in finding out about uh, what it's like to live a, as a type 1 diabetic. So, um, yeah, one day, someday we'll, we'll find an expert to school us on type 1 diabetes. Right. So as for type two, um, I found it very confusing when I went look. The first thing I did is I looked for an ebook. You know, yeah. What is diabetes? And nobody had a really good metabolic description of what diabetes was, or um, how to deal with it. Mostly, it was just about coming to accept your diabetes. And, you know, it was almost like a grieving book, you know, it was kind of, yeah, pretty much kind of strange in a way. Like I, and I can't remember what the book that I read, but after it, I was just as confused as I was before. What, how come one day you're, you had, don't have diabetes and the next day you do, these are questions that it didn't answer. And is it just a level of blood sugar or is it a level of sustained blood sugar? What is there? A re what happens there? And I, I couldn't get a straight answer. So. Give us the answer, Richard. Well, the the simplest answer is diabetes is the observation that a person is unable to keep their blood glucose in a safe range. And that applies to anybody who has diabetes type 1, type 2, gestational. Uh, and there's a bunch of different kinds of uh, – there's a, a, a type uh, 2.5 diabetes and a 1.5 diabetes. And, oh, geez, and I didn't know that. I, I know. They're, they're, and they're all – there's lots of different ways that uh, your system can go wrong uh, such that your blood glucose goes high. One of the problems is that diabetes is not really a disease. Diabetes is the observation of a symptom. And that is, you know, you, your, your blood sugar really should be between about 70 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. In Australian terms, that's about between uh, about 3.8 millimoles per litre to 5.5 millimoles per litre. Generally, the diagnosis is made that two hours after you 
after you've eaten, your blood sugar should go up from eating and then it should go down from insulin responding to it. And if your blood sugar is over about 140 milligrams per deciliter in the American scale or 7.7 millimoles per liter in the Australian scale, if two hours after eating your blood is above those ranges, then that's considered to be a diagnosis of diabetes. But the problem really is that lots of things can make your sugar go high. Yeah. For example, somebody who's got type 1, their their problem is that they're not making any insulin. Right. Type 2 diabetes is really the opposite of type 1 diabetes. Type 1, they don't make any insulin. Type 2, you make too much insulin. We'll talk a little bit more about the method there. but And you make too much insulin because the insulin becomes less effective at clearing glucose. It's not actually the insulin that's having the problem. The problem is that you're unable to hear the message of insulin. And so you may be producing perfectly good insulin, uh, but you're, you've developed a resistance to that insulin. You hear about insulin resistance a lot. And that is essentially what type 2 diabetes is, is insulin resistance. Right. But where is that resistance taking place? Is it at a cellular level? Is it at the mitochondrial level? Where is it? It's in your cells um, and it'll, it's in your organs. And so different organs will have different types of, of resistance. But essentially what happens is we release hormones in a pulsatile manner and we do mm. that so that we don't develop a resistance. A type 2 diabetic, generally a type 2 diabetic genetically uh, makes three times the glucose in their liver that a normal person does. So they've got a continual little drip of glucose coming out of their liver. Most people only make glucose when their blood sugar goes low, but a type 2 diabetic is making it all the time. And you say that's a, is it always a genetic reason for that? Or could a high fat, high carb diet have brought that on? There are some things that can make your insulin resistance worse. Uh, but as far as we understand, and there may be other causes, the initial problem, as far as we understand, is that type 2s make three times the glucose in their liver. Because they're making glucose all the time, they have to make insulin. And because they're making insulin all the time, body never gets a break from the insulin. So it develops a resistance to that insulin. And that's at a cellular level. That's right. It's across the whole system. Chronic glucose equals chronic insulin. And chronic insulin over time becomes insulin resistance. And it takes decades to do this. And then insulin resistance causes something called compensatory hyperinsulinemia. The insulin resistance means you have to make more insulin and making more insulin increases the insulin resistance, which means you have to make more insulin. And it's a, it's a cycle. That it's a vicious cycle. That's right. So the way that the ketogenic diet addresses this is by reducing glucose, um, dietary glucose, essentially. And therefore, when there's less glucose, that means the pancreas doesn't have to secrete insulin because that's the whole reason the pancreas does secrete insulin is to clear the glucose, right? Yeah. What actually happens is that you're producing all the insulin. Eventually, your pancreas burns out. And it stops producing insulin. And that means your glucose goes up. And that's when your doctor first notices that you might be having prediabetes. So both type 1 and type 2 arrive at the same place, which is you're not making enough insulin, but yes. by different means. Yes. Yes. So type 2 diabetes is not only insulin resistance, but it means that your pancreas isn't producing as much insulin because it's sort of falling on deaf ears. Yeah, pretty much. And the more that you work your pancreas, the more likely it will burn out and never come back. And at that point, yeah. a type 2 diabetic also has to, in, has to inject insulin. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. It's not nice. So that's why you really need to nip this in the bud quickly. So you say your doctor can notice this um, you know, early on and say that you have pre-diabetes. What are the markers for that? Yeah, pretty much your blood sugar starts to go up, but it doesn't go up into a diabetic range. And if your doctor is on the ball and they're getting you fasting blood glucose sort of annually, he'll probably pick that up. But 10 years before that happens, remember, this is only happening because your pancreas is giving up. Mm. 10 years before that, it's possible to diagnose uh, insulin resistance using what's called an insulin assay. This was something invented by Dr. Joseph R. Kraft, and he identified four patterns, uh, four insulin resistance patterns that happen over 10 years before the pancreas starts to give up and over 10 years before anyone else can diagnose 
uh, that somebody is going to become diabetic. Hmm. And in some cases, it could take 20 or 30 years before their pancreas gives up. It really, that's unique to the individual. But um, in his case, uh, he was able to identify that somebody, even before somebody is obese, even before somebody has started to see blood sugars go up, 10 years before that, in fact, he's able to show their insulin goes high because they've basically developing insulin resistance and compensatory hyperinsulinemia. Hmm. And then 10 years down the road, the pancreas gives up and the blood sugars start going up. And there's this myth that obesity causes type 2 diabetes. Right. Yeah. The two, the two seem to be linked in many people's minds. Yeah. We can actually tell, we can use logic to tell that this is not true because thin people get type 2 diabetes and some fat people don't have type 2 diabetes. So it's not necessarily, right. it, they don't necessarily go hand in hand. What the craft patterns show is that insulin resistance comes first and then obesity and then 10 years after the insulin resistance, pancreatic burnout can start to happen and then your glucose starts to rise and then you become pre-diabetic and then that lasts long enough and then you become full-on diabetic. Hmm. Uh, and I think that this is a this idea that obesity causes insulin resistance is a is an example of a post hoc fallacy uh, after therefore because of we see the person gets di uh, obese first and then they become diabetic so therefore it makes sense to think well the obesity causes the diabetes but in fact the insulin resistance is causing both the obesity and the diabetes and so I see. they're just two two downstream effects. So because this myth is so widespread that obesity, uh, if, you, if you just diet enough and lose weight, then you may be able to control your diabetes, which, as you just pointed out, is a myth. Because of that, there's a lot of crazy ideas about how diabetics should eat. Isn't there? I like to call it the moral view of type 2 diabetes. And that's where people accuse, basically say, you know, diabetes is caused by gluttony and sloth. Right. But these, these things are biochemical. Your cells are starving. Insulin resistance prevents glucose from getting into the cells, for, so they can't burn glucose for energy. High insulin causes your fat cells to be unable to release fatty acids for burning, and so your cells can't burn fatty acids for energy. So your cells basically are getting very little energy that they can use. And so, and that's why you're tired all the time, and you get that sluggishness of, uh, you know, after you eat a pizza or something. And this is the only thing that really explains the paradox of why your cells are starving in a body that's full of excess energy. You, it, the energy is all locked up in the fat cells. And as long as insulin is high, that energy can't come out of the fat cells. And as long as the insulin resistance is there, you can't access the glucose. So um, the obvious strategy from a cellular level for your cells is to get more energy, which is gluttony, and don't waste any energy getting it, which is sloth. So uh, <laughs> that really explains from a cellular level uh, really why these things, that these things are biochemical in nature. So if left unchecked and untreated, what does type 2 diabetes end up as? What is the end game? Yeah, there's some pretty horrible things that happen with, uh, with type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is essentially a vascular disease. Uh, it's a, a disease of the blood vessels. Kidney disease, all of the, the small blood vessels that feed the kidney um, become inflamed. And so uh, lots of diabetics end up on dialysis. Um, you can get neuropathy, which is uh, peripheral nerves um, dying back. Um, which can also result in amputations as people get diabetic ulcers because they can't feel injuries done to their feet. Right. This is the first thing my doctor asked me is like, you have, yeah. you have any tingling in your toes and fingers? You know, yeah. they want to know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So, um, so that again is another vascular issue. Uh, you've also got uh, cardiovascular disease, obviously. Um, right. And, and we know that, in, we know that insulin causes uh, cardiovascular disease because, uh, um, that dog study that we referred to during the insulin show where um, right. the scientists put uh, insulin straight into the femoral artery of a dog and the leg that had the insulin in it, all of the arteries became atherogenic. So, uh, mm. or arteriosclerotic. So th that's a horrible thing. Then, then just high levels of glucose can also cause some bad things. The, 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 the vascular disease is mainly from the insulin. So I, I've heard it described as you, your body is rotting from the inside out. Yeah, pretty and and it's pretty and horrible th through through your blood vessels and uh, high levels of glucose also uh, can damage your eyes. Uh, there's um, cells mm. in your eyes that are 
non-insulin-dependent cells. That is, they don't require insulin to get glucose in. When your glucose goes up, most of your cells require insulin. And if you're not producing a lot of insulin or you're insulin resistant, then then you're not getting a lot of glucose into your cells. But those cells that don't require insulin, they take it all. People who get uh, diabetic um, cataracts, that's because basically the cells in the lens of their eye have become ex- basically filled up full of glucose and exploded. And uh, basically the osmotic pressure is basically blowing them apart. Wow. I didn't know that. So cataracts are a direct result of high blood sugar. Yes. Is that the only thing that causes cataracts? Uh, no. Uh, ultraviolet light will cause cataracts. There's some other things mm. that will cause it. I, I actually have a dog with uh, that has Cushing's disease, which is a disease of the adrenal gland, but it causes diabetes. And so she's got diabetes. And uh, within probably about a week or two of her getting diabetes, or of us noticing that she had diabetes and she was drinking and urinating a lot, within two weeks of that, she was entirely blind from cataracts. So uh, wow. she's been blind for a year and we, we've started to get control of her blood sugar now. And uh, we still she has to have 50 IU of insulin every day. Wow. Uh, every day, morning, morning and afternoon. So um, wow. hopefully we've got her blood sugar controlled now. We're going to get the operation to remove her cataracts. So we're going to call it two keto dogs now. <laughs> <laughs> two keto dogs. Well, I am feeding. I'm. I am feeding her pure meat. So she just eats That's kangaroo great. meat. That's it, all she eats. Kangaroo meat. Kangaroo meat. Pretty much. It's. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's. It's. It's pretty often. Wow. Oh wow. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> now we've spoken before of HbA1c. This is a yes. percentage marker of how glycated your red blood cells are. Yes, it's an average over three months of your blood sugar level. Oh, right. Exactly. Red blood cells only live for three months. So basically, that's how you work out a, a three month average. And the HbA1c, uh, five is normal. Yeah. And di- diabetic ranges are anything over six and a half. When I was first diabetic, my HbA1c was 11.2. Oh my gosh. That was over 10% of my red blood cells were useless, unable to carry oxygen. So, hmm. um, the uh, the medical community is happy if they can get your HbA1c down to like 6.9. If they can get it just under 7, then that's a range that they're happy shooting for. Now, all of the horrible things that happen start happening at around about 5. Uh, vascular disease like cardiovascular disease starts happening at 5. Somebody who has an HbA1c of 6.9 has a significantly greater, like a, 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 I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but um, uh, I'll link the, the, the studies, but they'll have a significantly greater risk of all of these things. Um, and the, the, the reason why the medical community doesn't try to get your HbA1c to 5, which is where you would have no risks of these things is because the way that we control this traditionally is that we give people drugs that lower their blood glucose. So there's a potential if you try to aim for five that you'll overshoot and you'll get three and a half and you'll put the person into a diabetic coma. Ah. So it's really a, a malpractice insurance uh, or malpractice risk. No doctor really wants to give a, a patient uh, a treatment that's going to put them into a coma. So um, wow. so, so they don't risk it. They, they aim for getting your HPA A1C to 6.9, but of course... People at that level of blood sugar, all of their risks are really quite high. All right. So can we talk about the recommended quote unquote diet uh, for type 2 diabetics by most diabetes associations, including the Australian and the American Diabetes Association? Yes, I just uh, put up a blog post today called Eat for Diabetes, and I'll link it in the show notes. Um, But basically, uh, when I was first diagnosed with diabetes, the first thing that happens is you meet a diabetes educator and they give you, their, their job is to do two things. They've got to give you a packet of pamphlets, which will tell you they're basically things to take home and study. And they, they have to have a conversation with you, preparing you to accept the fact that type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease and that from this point on, it will only get worse. There's no cure. There's no there's reversing no cure, it. There's no reversing yeah. it. Um, and with drugs and lifestyle changes, the, the most optimistic future is to try and slow the progression. I, I can shorten this story. It's unbelievable how much sugar they have you eating. Incredible, isn't and it? And why? Why? Yeah. The, what's, the, the th- what's the thinking here? Uh, well, these are, these are people who have a, a clear inability to process sugar. Right. And they're talking about giving you th- 304 grams of glucose per day. 
Uh, this is this is the diet for losing weight, and, and and also very low fat. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh well, definitely. And and margarine. And margarine. Margarine. Uh, okay. So I I got a story for you. A quick one about yeah, margarine. Sure. I travel to and from Boston between Connecticut and Boston a lot because that's where the airport is, right? Yeah. So I'm coming home from Boston and San Francisco. I'm coming down the Mass Pike. And of course, there's a place to stop. Now, I haven't eaten all day and all flight because I'm fasting. I need some low-carb food. So I stopped. There's a Boston market. And I don't know if you know what this is, but it's like rotisserie chicken, a bunch of sides, cornbread, yada, yada, Mm -hmm. yada. So, and and I get a a half a chicken dark meat, which is all good. I get some cream spinach. I get some green beans. I'm ready to go. And I ask, do you have butter? Nope. Margarine. Oh. Is that okay? I'm like, what? <laughs> what's wrong with you people? Don't you read anything? Margarine's oh. like so bad. I know it's full of trans fats. It's uh, yeah, and they're getting. This is part of the recommended diabetes side. I noticed that margarine was margarine. on the list. Hey, well, the, not the, butter. Three hundred and four grams of glucose. If a teaspoon of sugar is about four grams of glucose, they're talking about making giving you a diet which is seventy six teaspoons of sugar. In the day. That's unbelievable. Almost no fat. Now, right. there's a reason why they do this. And just in case you weren't convinced by that, I just went looking on Amazon.com for a diabetes cookbook. And the first one that came up, so it's 8a.2keto.com. It's a shortcut. Okay. Yeah, Number sure. 2, K-E-T-O.com. And that'll bring you to this type 2 diabetes cookbook. And I just did the look inside on Amazon so you can yep. scroll forward. And the first category I came to is appetizers, snacks, and spreads. All right. The first recipe, onion crisps, Norwegian style, which includes an eight ounce box of Norwegian style crackers. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, there's Parmesan cheese, onion soup mix, three quarters of a cup of low fat mayonnaise, because you know, Ooh. fat's bad it's for diabetes, right? Gels. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm kidding. Uh, the next one. Next page, seasoned oyster crackers, an 11 ounce box of oyster crackers in this recipe. Incredible. Next one, Italian pita squares, two pitas about six inches in diameter, two teaspoons of light margarine. Ugh. Next one, cereal party mix, two tablespoons of margarine, half a teaspoon of salt, two teaspoons of Worcestershire, one cup of rice cereal, one cup of wheat cereal, one cup of thin pretzel sticks. Dude, it's 2016. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I tell you why they're doing this, because we've already said that insulin uh, raises the risk of cardiovascular disease. It's been observed that diabetics get get heart attacks at four times the rate of non-diabetics. And so uppermost in their mind is this whole, well, we can't feed them anything that's going to give them heart attacks. And everybody still believes that eating fat gives you heart attacks. Exactly. And nothing could be further th- from the truth. I'll let people go to my web, uh, to my blog to read how horrible <laughs> the, uh, the recipe is. I've actually put it into my fitness pal to uh, calculate all of the uh, macronutrients uh, for the right. entire recipe. But uh, I'll let people go to my blog to, to, to see how horrible it is. But it's, it's, it's no better than that diabetic cookbook that you've got there. All right. So we all know that a low carb diet is really good for controlling insulin, but it's not just that. You have to go ketogenic and people are still afraid of fat. I, I'm telling my mother this and she's, I, I talked about my mother before. Mm-hmm. She's, um, you know, she's thin, but she doesn't look well. She doesn't feel well. She's very little fat. I got done explaining all the science to her and she says, well, I'm glad it's working for you. I'm still going to cut the fat off my steak. Okay, whatever. You can lead a horse to water, you can't make yeah, him drink. Yeah, and you know, somebody who's in their 70s just isn't going to up and change. Right, it's yeah. just the way it is. So the low-carb diet is okay, but if you do low-fat at the same time, what are you doing? How can you do both at the same time? Well, you're either hypercaloric or you're, it's a high-protein diet. And if it's high-protein, we know that any extra protein that isn't synthesized goes into the uh, metabolic processing stream. Right, and becomes glucose. So. And becomes glucose in your your kidneys have a hard time getting rid of the, uh, Nitrogen, the after yeah. effects of it. So it's interesting to have a look at a ketogenic diet in the context of uh, type 2 diabetes because um, we know that the ketogenic diet helps you lose weight. We also know that obesity is not the cause of diabetes. 
It's a downstream effect of diabetes. But one of the steps along the way of developing diabetes is liver fat, it creating lots and lots of liver fat, triglycerides, basically. And that's fat in your liver, like your liver actually becomes foie gras. Yeah, it's literally foie gras. Uh, you know how you make foie gras? You f- feed an animal corn, <laughs> you know. Right. Excess carbohydrates turn into triglycerides and get deposited in your fat cells, but a lot of it gets deposited locally. And what's local is the liver and the pancreas. And so we've actually seen that um, – we've seen people reverse pancreatic burnout – if their HbA1c is uh, under about 8.5, it's possible to still reverse pancreatic burnout. 8.5 seems really high. Yeah, well, no. I mean, as I say, mine was 11.2. But uh, wow. the longer you go, the higher it's going to go unless you take drugs that um, that bring it down. I see. Well, or if you if you bring it down with the uh, diet, which is what we're doing. Which is what we're doing. So we know we've we've seen the Newcastle study uh, show this effect in MRIs. They're able to see the the triglycerides in the pancreas. They were able to put somebody on a hypochloric diet, see the triglycerides go, and their pancreas started producing insulin again. Wow! So we know that a ketogenic diet also does the same. It also drives down triglycerides. So it's not so much that a ketogenic diet uh, reduces obesity and obesity putatively causes diabetes. Right. It reduces both symptoms at the same time. That's right. A ketogenic diet specifically targets triglycerides because um, you make triglycerides for the most part from from carbohydrates and a ketogenic diet has none of those. So it's very, it's very unintuitive for people to grasp that um, eating fat and not eating carbs at the same time is the, is the key. And many people try one but not the other. You know, they try uh, reducing the fat as well as the the carbs, or they try, you know, everybody pretty much agrees that they shouldn't eat sugar, but then, you know, they'll have a slice of bread. And as long as you're having bread, your insulin is too high. But for type 2 diabetics, as the longer that they're type 2 diabetic, the more insulin they have. Mm. So... Jason Fung says, this, you know, that uh, type 2 diabetes is a disease of insulin. And so if right. a disease of too much insulin, you don't want to give the person insulin, you want to reduce their insulin. And that's why things right. like fasting and ketogenic diet all work very well because they're all different ways to reduce the insulin. But there's a secondary advantage. These are all long-term things. You can you can help somebody become more healthy over the long term of the ketogenic diet because you're reducing insulin, you're reducing triglycerides in the pancreas. But there's a short-term benefit for uh, for ketogenic diets for specifically for people with diabetes, and that is that it's a, a form of backup glucose control. So somebody who's type 2 diabetic is unable to bring their blood sugar down by releasing selectively releasing insulin. It, their insulin doesn't work or their cells that are supposed to take up that blood sugar are unable to hear the insulin. And so their ability to tamp down the effect of eating glucose uh, is broken. So they're unable to control their glucose. But if they don't eat any carbohydrates, then what happens is the liver makes glucose for them and it makes just the right amount so and what happens is the liver kicks in whenever blood glucose goes low Uh, the liver kicks in makes a bit of glucose blood glucose goes back up into the normal range it slowly gets consumed because they've got a small amount of insulin uh, running through the body and this wouldn't be the case with type ones and we we could probably do that in another show but certainly for type twos who who are still making a little bit of insulin then then the ketogenic diet basically provides this backup form of glucose control Hmm. and the Important thing is, is you, you just got to not eat any. If you eat any, then all of a sudden you go, your glucose goes high, and you mm. you don't have any ability to tamp it down. You just got the ability right. to to boost it up from underneath. Very good. And it's not just our experiences that we're talking about here. We've done it firsthand. We know. We've seen it. Next week, I'm going to read my numbers from my blood test. Yeah, you get your numbers for the first time. And how long has it been? Uh, since February 1st? Actually, no, I haven't had my numbers done since last year. Right. November, I think it so was. So you'll actually see the result of three months or four months of, uh, of uh, ketogenic diet. Either we're going to get a lot of new listeners or everybody's going to go, what a bunch of hooey. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. No pressure. I do. I, I pretty much do mine every April. So, uh, so probably in about two weeks' time, I'm going to do mine as well. So, uh, so after we've uh, analyzed yours, we'll probably go through mine. Like we say, we're going to do another show about type 1 diabetes when we find an expert to come in and talk with us about it. And if that's you, you think, send us an email, dudes at 2ketodudes.com. Absolutely. Or uh, just leave us a message on 2ketodudes.com. All right, I think it's time for recipes. Could you say y'all do for a little? Recipes. 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 <laughs> Richard, you're going first today. What do you got? Yeah. Okay, well, I've, I've got some fast food survival tips. You're on the road. All you've got is McDonald's. How can you eat keto? Okay. Yeah. In Australia, there's actually an easy answer that probably only applies in New York. In Australia, we've got these uh, kiosks where you've got massive large touch screens and you can build your burger and you can say, I want lettuce instead of a bun and I want mayonnaise instead of a special sauce and I want right. three patties and two kinds of bacon and three kinds of cheese. Sure. And, yeah, make it – make it. I want that stat. And, and they'll give you a $15 burger. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think they've got those now in New York and so um, – so that is that is an option, but you can make it. You can make yourself a keto burger just by throwing away the bun for the most part. Sure, you've got to watch out for special sauces. Often have a lot of sugar in them. And Terrible. Stuff. So um, no ketchup. Get mayo, but no ketchup. Yeah, right? that's right. And mayonnaise, even even the worst, even the worst light mayonnaise is still better than than uh, sweet sweet ketchup. Yeah. So um, I've got a couple of uh, options from some of the keto ninjas. And also from another mate, Malcolm, who Malcolm says that uh, he likes to uh, often use kebab, go to a kebab store because uh, you can get a kebab plate with just meat. Um, and yep. uh, and if the meat is a little bit lean um, and they haven't kept the fatty cuts with it, you can just grab a pad of butter and butter on meat. Butter on lean meat works well to. to if they make it have fatty. it, maybe they have margarine <laughs> instead. <laughs> Bring your maybe. own butter, folks. <laughs> is margarine good? <laughs> BYOB, bring your own butter. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, um, so there's also another option which is uh, from one of the the ninjas, and that is a thing called a McMountain. McMountain. McMountain, and it's it's you start off with a double cheeseburger or a McDouble, I think they call it in America. No, a double quarter pounder. It's a double quarter pounder. Double quarter pounder with cheese. Okay, so you start off with one of those without without the bun. Yeah. And uh, uh, let's see, it uh, a McDouble is about a dollar forty nine with or without the bun. So you just toss mm -hmm. the bun. Uh, you get uh, some uh, packets of mayonnaise, which should be free. Mm -hmm. uh, you also can get uh, two extra slices of cheese. Yep. And they also have a patty only option for quarter pounders. So you basically get a McDouble, and you get two extra patties of quarter pounders, two extra slices of cheese, and then you ask them to, uh, if they if they can, put it on a plate. Yeah, throw in a knife and fork. Most of them will. And throw in a knife and fork. And, and so that's that's a, that's that's a lot of meat and a lot of fat. And that'll that'll keep you going. I've found you can go to uh, Wendy's. And yeah. I don't know if you have Wendy's in Australia, but... We don't, but when I was in America, we used to eat there a lot. And yeah, I love yeah. Wendy's. And they make triples, but they'll also make quadruples if you ask them. Just tell and, them you want a quadruple with no bun and a knife and yeah. fork in a box and, uh, and you know, hold the ketchup. And that's good stuff. Nice. We used to be able to get, uh, we used to be able to get them to do a burger in lettuce, lettuce buns when we were there, yep. when we lived there. And also, they also have a Five Guys does that. Yeah, uh, right. And they also have, Wendy's also have a breakfast bowl option, or they used to have a breakfast bowl option, which was uh, basically scrambled eggs, uh, fried eggs, cheese, and a, and a patty, which is, and a sausage. So there you go, that was all good stuff. If you have to, you can get by with just a McDonald's. Uh, I know that uh, other people say Chipotle is uh, a pretty good keto option. Um, you can basically order two sides of meat and a side of guacamole, which is about six dollars, but it's you know decent quality meat and uh, and good macros if you get the pork or beef. Yep. Um, and you can even get the sofritas if you're a keto vegetarian. Very good. Some burger joints will do lettuce wrap burgers, and uh, we've got a chain in Australia called Grill Apostrophe D Grilled. And they they do something called a 
low carb super bun, which is basically made from almond meal and egg whites. Great, I know, and uh, and they're very tasty. So, and the the burgers are the burgers are premium uh, burgers, so it's all grass fed, and, and it's you know they're they're fifteen dollar burgers too. So, uh, it's not cheap, but um, you know if you if you want you can you can put together a, a couple of burgers in McDonald's for about five dollars if you. If and you, you really could also got- bring your own oopsie bread and put them between that, you know. Well, that's you true. You just have yeah. to do a re- re- reassembling, that's all. Yeah, that just takes a little bit of uh, forward planning. Yep. Yeah, I, I usually find the reason I'm going to a fast food joint is because I've done absolutely no forward planning. <laughs> so that's that's my uh, that's my trick for fast food survival. I've got uh, a link to a blog post about how to do it, and uh, and uh, good luck with that in the world. Great. So what have you got, Carl? Well, like I said, I was at my friend Scott's house in Berkeley, Last week, and he made these amazing carnitas, old school way. And carnitas mm, nice. is pork that's cooked mm. in pork fat. Something that I learned, and I can't remember, I think I saw this on Iron Chef America. Um, the word fajitas actually yeah. means skirt steak. Really? And so when you see chicken fajitas, that's a contradiction in terms. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. It's like chicken skirt steak. Yeah, and I learned that on Iron Chef, and I, I didn't corroborate it, but I figured if they put it out there, you know, there's probably something to it. Anyway, uh, I'm probably going to get raked over the coals for that one, but I'll throw <laughs> it out there anyway. Uh, please feel free to correct anything I say. Yeah. Uh, carnitas, you want to essentially take a pork butt, which is the pork shoulder, mm. or you could do it with boneless country pork ribs too, but pork butt is the typical way. And maybe three or four pounds. It depends on how much you want to make. That's the wonderful thing about cooking is once you learn just uh, about ratios and how much salt to add and how much this to add, you you can just eyeball it. Yeah. But you could start with three pounds. Just chop it up into manageable chunks, maybe one pound chunks or half pound chunks. And then you want to get lard and you want to get like three pounds of lard. Oh, yeah. You want that lard to cover the pork melted. In a casserole, it has to be completely submerged. Nice. In the states, do you get uh, lard like butter? In uh, in yeah, because we we just get it, um, it, you know wrapped in paper. It's, uh... Yeah, we get this. I think Armor is the brand, and uh, comes in one pound blocks, and you can just uh, use it. You know, throw it in there, melt it. Three, maybe four pounds. It, de- it depends on how big your casserole is and how much meat you want, but just know that you have to cover it. Okay. So you want to throw salt to taste in there, maybe, you know, a teaspoon, half a teaspoon, whatever. I'm not really sure. Oranges. Get a couple of oranges. Yeah, Mm. oranges. This is the classic carnitas, right? Cut them in half and just poke them down in there. Peel and all. Yeah, peel and all. Um, You can also throw a couple of limes in there. Limes go really well with salt and pork. You know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The original recipe calls for dolce de leche, which is like a sweetened condensed milk. Okay. Uh, You can forego that. Maybe some heavy cream, right? Heavy cream, good. Or coconut cream, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, Mm. I would experiment with that. I'm not so Mm. sure I would want to taste that, but uh, we'll see. I can't believe they have sweetened condensed milk in in a pork meat. That's... Yeah, yeah, that's... that's, And some people even add, as my friend Scott does, a splash of Coca-Cola. Okay. But, uh, you know, you can do without that too, can't you? Yeah. It's really about the lard, the salt, the lime, the orange, and, you know, some cream would be good too. And you just want to cook it and cook it and cook it. You might want to throw an onion in there, you know, half an onion for flavor as well. Sure. And, And just don't boil it too much. You want it bubbling just a little bit over a flame, but not really boiling. You, you want to slow cook this thing. So could you do it in a slow cooker like a, a crock pot? I'm sure or you could. Like that? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it would be great in a crock pot. Yeah. Which reminds me, tomorrow I'm doing uh, beef short ribs in the crock pot. I'll let you know how that turns out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, the traditional way to eat carnitas is as a taco. Now, I know that we can't eat tortillas. It's a real shame too because tortillas are wonderful. There are some low carb tortillas, but yeah, you really you can't know. have t- you can't have more than one and or maybe a half of one and that's just not enough. You have kind of you have can't eat this. you want to have a four or five, yeah. Right. So an alternative to taco shells is to take a slice of Munster cheese. Yeah. And microwave it for a minute or you know cook it in a skillet 
mm-hmm. and then take it and drape it over a wooden spoon so right. it turns into a shell. Yeah. Or, you know, do like I do, just eat the meat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can also you can make it like a lettuce wrap. You, you know, you can have a, a, a taco shell that's made totally out of lettuce. You just got to look, give yeah. you some crunch. Crunch would be nice Give you texture, some crunch. Maybe. That's great. Because you do want to eat this with some chopped tomatoes and lettuce and some cheese and stuff and, you know, get nice, that taco. Yeah. Maybe some uh, a guacamole over the top or mm. even some avocado cream would be great. Yeah. So, and uh, also cilantro. Cilantro is a must for this kind of thing. Right. Unless, of course, you hate cilantro and it yeah. tastes like soap to you. <laughs> Unless it's soapy for you, in which case, <laughs> use Thai basil. As I found Thai basil doesn't, doesn't cause me a problem and has a similar taste profile. So. But here's the thing, kids. If you're eating that much fat, don't eat tortillas because that's no. going to go, it's all going to go to waste. Yeah. You know, the benefit that you get from eating fat is lost if you're eating a tortilla. So don't do it. No. I wouldn't even eat a low carb tortilla. No, I agree. I just eat the meat. It's yummy. That's what I got, Richard. I think that's a show. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for that. And uh, as we said before, write us email at dudes at two keto dudes.com. Go on the website, two keto dudes.com. Leave a comment there. If you want to go to the actual show, you can go into the archives and see the show name there and leave a comment on that page too. Whatever you like to do, just get in touch. We look forward to hearing from you. Yep. Keto on. Yeah. We'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Yeah.